Frederick Erickson, thanks very much for uh, joining me today. How are you? I'm fine, and you? Good, good. Uh, I'm very excited to have people from the EU joining a, a US-centric uh, podcast. I think we need more collaboration. The world is, is getting smaller and smaller uh, from all perspectives, from policy, from technology, from people, and so on and so on. So I'm very excited to have you. And before we jump into our topic today, which is the recent publication uh, by your organization, why don't we walk me through memory lane? Just, sure. uh, you know, how you become to be influencer in the policy and AI and cloud computing. So uh, you, you mean my own background going into it or yes. what I've been doing? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean the way I'm, I'm looking at it is that you know, regardless what point in history that you're going to dip your toe into, if you really want to understand the broad factors of change, especially in the economy, you have to step into technology and you have to look at, in that particular historical period of time, what did technology do in order to reshape the way you produce, the way you consume, the way you interact with other people. And for me, coming from more sort of an international economic background, that was my academic background. That's what I've been working on in the past. Even if, even if we didn't start off by talking technology, technology is what it's all about. If you want to understand changes that happen over the long term that generate prosperity, you have to understand technology. And now we're lucky because we live in a period where at least there is a promise of pretty fast technological change that can emerge, especially on the back of so the, sort of the broad change in computer technology and data that started a few decades ago. And I, I find that just to be exciting, to exciting to see how it reshapes the way we work, the way we collaborate with each other, the way companies are structured, the way profits and value is generated in the economy. And stepping into cloud or AI or quantum or, you know, all these different aspects that you can take sort of a, a, a look into this particular world. It's just very, very exciting. And that is what I love about this field. Yeah, it's never a dull moment. So were you, were you always interested in technology of growing up? I mean, in, in, in one way or the other. I mean, not not interested in the sense that I was the number one computer geek in my village where I grew up for that you went to in order to sort of play the sort of the versions of computer games that existed when I was young. But uh, I've always been fascinated more by what technology does to society than technology itself. Um, if you if you want someone to sort of open up the hood of a computer and explain how these things um, how these things operate, I'm not the right person to go uh, to go and ask. But but I'm more curious about what happens to people and what happens to organization on the back of technology. And the broader question behind that, of course, is what happens with people when they acquire more knowledge? When you begin to structure science and have a structured pursuit of knowledge, which is a pretty, I mean, it's an old, it's an old phenomenon in itself, but you, if you if you think about so the rise of academia and the rise of science, it's basically the late 19th century where we start to do it for real. And my God, how that's have been reshaping society. So I'm, that's what I'm fascinated about. And if we look back, it's funny because um, sometimes you can only tell you're in the midst of unbelievable change post the change. Like, you know, if you look uh, in hindsight, uh, to what happened, uh, you know, we talked about industrial revolution, right? Uh, when we people were in the midst of it, I don't think that they saw it as an industrial revolution. They just saw things coming, changing, and so on. Um, can you point a finger of? And we are arguably in one right now with the introduction of AI and technological ch changes. Can you point a finger in terms of when did it start? And why, and again, we can discuss this, but why things seems to be accelerating from, from all fronts in adoption and deployments and in the effect it has on society? Mm. Well, I mean, I mean, I think sort of one way to approach that is to ask sort of what, what, what is a good indicator 
of uh, how technology is impacting on your own life. And my my best, I mean, the, the, one, the one thing that I ask myself and the one thing that I ask to a lot of organizations and companies that I from time to time work with is, is so can you tell me what have you stopped doing over the last, say, week, month, year, in order to start doing something else, something where you can where you can allocate resources in a better way, where you can economize the resources in a better way. And, and I, I still think this is, this is probably the, the, the biggest question to ask because innovation in its essence is basically about stop doing things and start doing new things. And, and when you pose the question like that, that's also when you're going to figure out that many individuals and many organizations are very, very conservative that things that it takes a long time to change things and and individuals and organizations may not be very good at it uh, which is why if we look at the sort of the broad changes that technology has has brought to the economy it usually comes from new players from new companies new entrepreneurs who come up with doing a thing which we didn't do in the past and that all organizations weren't prepared to do so I, I sometimes use the example. I mean, I'm I'm a Swede by by birth, so I'm I'm I've sort of been close to the big telecom development that emerged in the 1990s on the back of companies like Ericsson and of course Finnish Nokia. And what is amazing about that development and these companies is that by the late 1990s, early 2000s, they basically all had they had all the products that Apple later came to pioneer. Nokia tried with a touchscreen mobile phone. They started to develop an app store. Uh, Ericsson launched a, a product that they called, they called it a cordless web screen. Um, and today we know it as uh, an iPad. Uh, they, they developed these products, but then they started, decided not to go ahead and market them in any broader way. And they can come up with sort of all goods of explanations to why, why are not marketing new technologies that you are pioneering yourself, uh, but at the heart of it was that they weren't willing to start to compete with themselves because they already had other ranges of products that were extremely profitable and these new technologies was basically going to start to compete with themselves. So uh, that's why they, they didn't put sort of a lot of money into trying to create these markets that Apple later came to create. And I find that very fascinating that back then, of course, if you, if you were thinking, which are the companies in the world who are going to lead a broad development where data, where individuals are going to work with screens and with different type of devices that structure their working life, their professional life, you would point to companies like Ericsson uh, knock and say, these are probably the two companies that are going to lead that revolution. Both companies are, I mean, they are still around, but they are sort of just a shred of what they usually, what, what they were back in the 1990s, and they weren't prepared to do the change. Um, same thing with individuals themselves. I mean, if you, if you, if you really uh, want to figure out what the trends are going to be 10 years from now, don't look at people like myself, R rather look at the 15-year-olds and 20-year-olds and see their way of interact interaction with technology. That's what it's going to look like 10 years from now. And, and we are, we're a creature of habit. Uh, we are resistant to change and individually as well as collectively for organizations. And I think that's, that's what's happening at the leadership level. Uh, people that are you know, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it. Let's continue with the status quo. Uh, the issue is, as you described with the Ericsson um, example, and is that things are not, we don't live in a bubble. Meaning, whether you want it or not, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be affected by by change, regardless of, you know, regardless of what you think you can, you can affect uh, or, or not do. And so that's a that's a great segue to what we're going to be talking about. So first, let's talk a bit about the organization. Uh, you, you're you're part of the European uh, Center for uh, International P uh, Political Economy. Talk to me about the mandate for the organization and uh, the like the requirements. What's what's its goal uh, to to achieve in the European Union? 
So I'm, I'm in the fortunate position because I was the one who actually created this organization and I did it very much on, on, on the basis of my own work experience. I had been having a career where I had one foot in academia, another foot in, in policy, and I've been working for governments and for international organizations. I had one foot in journalism and I had one foot in, in business and especially investment banking that I've been working in. So and Frederick, if, it, it sounds like the perfect, absolute perfect mix. It's very yeah, tough well, to find I mean, somebody with, with all those different, different domains expertise. Yes. But you know, here's the thing. I, I, I love doing all these things. My only problem was that I didn't just want to do one of them. Um, so I was trying to figure out for myself. So what, what can I do where I can combine all these different things in order to have a working life of the kind that I want to have. And I think creating a think tank became the answer. Uh, now I was fortunate uh, to have other people around me who were also interested in doing a, that type of project, which was, you know, trying to figure out, um, how the international economy is going to be reshaped on the back of technology and other forces that are changing our society. You know, basic stuff like demography and the demographic development, for instance, trying to find a way to engage with some of these fundamental long-term developments that policymakers um, rarely uh, have the time or perhaps even the willingness in order to engage with them. Uh, but our, our basic purpose was basically, let's try to force these issues onto the agenda and let's try to engage with policymakers and see the extent to which at least we can bring analysis to them, which help them to figure out what type of policies that are going to, uh, they're going to use in order to be more capable of, uh, adopting to these changes, work with them in order to create more benefits, more prosperity. And the policymakers themselves, I think that one of the issues or I guess the attributes for a policymaker, they may be a little older. Um, you know, from talking about demographics, uh, they're not necessarily at the forefront of, of technology. Um, you know, you can see it here in the U S you know, members of Congress. Sometimes you can see like, they're not, uh, tech savvy at all, um, to say the least <laughs> yet, yeah. uh, they are, you know, sitting in the kind of the inner, uh, round rooms and discussion board uh, discussion um, you know decision making process for some major technological decisions and policy that are affecting these decisions so it's a bit of an oxymoron there uh, so so talk to me about the day to day it's a it's a big task right so influencing uh, it's almost like a you're a small tugboat trying to to move this giant cruise ship that's basically how I see it, because it's uh, the cruise ship is moving, regardless of where you, you know, if you're going to be there or not to try to divert it. How does that happen on a day to day basis um, in actuality? And it's, if you don't mind, open up the kimono to some of yeah. those processes. I mean, you, you, you're absolutely right in the sense that, uh, I mean, the ship of state is a big tanker that it's, it's moving slowly. And I was being kind, it, I said it was cruise ship. But it, it yes, indeed. Is a little bit better. Uh, yes, um, and if you want to change it, you're going to change it sort of by one degree at a time. That's you know, and, and ma ma making a, a 180 degree U-turn is going to take a very, very long, um, um, and especially going to take a long time if you look at sort of mature, almost saturated type of political systems where. You know, there is a lot of capital which has been invested in the current structure of industry. There's a lot of prestige and uh, and other emotions invested in policies and what type of policy structures we have. Um, other countries can move faster. Uh, I mean, one of one of the countries I just came back from the country. One of my country that I follow very very closely is South Korea, um, which is a country which has changed profoundly over a short period of time. Um, and not not just change in the way that they have caught up on the frontier economies in terms of GDP per capita, but in terms of actually moving to the frontier, leading the technological development in in many ways. Yeah, um, I believe which is like what, uh, I, Frederick, I believe they're in the two two thousand fifties already, compared to what oh, we are. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and it's it's the same thing. I mean, if you if you are in countries like I mean, smaller states like Singapore, that you will find that you, the the way your life is going to be organized is much more technology intensive than it is in New York, in Miami, or any other uh, metropolis in America, where you would at least superficially think that th these are really sort of cool places in terms of what they do with new technologies, but it's nothing compared to, to these countries. And some of that is a benefit because they, they don't have a lot of sunk costs, so they can start and move um, a bit faster than, than more mature and saturated economies can do. But there are also examples of, of, of that kind of economies that you can actually get change. And, and how does change happen? Well, you know, part of it is information. Part of it is new knowledge, and that's where we come in, in terms of trying to be helpful in bringing out the data, trying to look at the broad patterns, trying to identify the issues that are important and see how existing policies actually relate with these important things. But the other thing is motivation, and motivation is uh, a much, much bigger problem. I think we underestimate how important it is. The information problem, if we can take it like that, is actually pretty small in relation to the motivation problem that many policymakers have. So, I mean, if you talk about um, creating more opportunities for AI or how can we change education systems in order to actually use technology in a constructive way, which they offer to do, uh, the problem there is not information. You're not going to convince more teachers, more school administra administrators by more information. It's a motivational issue. And, and that's much more difficult. And I think that's where uh, having constructive political leadership, having, having leaders within organizations that are, you know, open and willing to test, explore new things and just be open-minded about it and uh, be transparent in the way they talk about what we're doing right now. Uh, estimating risk, estimating benefits in, in ways that are more honest than, than, than we're doing right now. I mean, when, when we start with many of these technology decisions right now, I'll give you an example. So we've been looking quite a lot into how public administrations use cloud. Um, and when you step into that area, you will, of course, immediately see that many public administrations work with data, which is very sensitive. It's, it's personal data. It can be everything from uh, your health records to um, if there is a, a sort of a, a, a council which has forced uh, a parent to move the children to a different home, for instance. I mean, this, these are extraordinarily important and sensitive issues. So when you start to think about, can we find, find a cloud solution to these information systems that we're creating about it, you have to understand the risk. You, you will have to work in a way to ensure that that you're capable of having a secure system. But you have to put that in relation to the security of what you're doing right now. Because what you're doing right now is not a secure system either. And we were uh, uh, working with uh, a public administration in, in one country where it turned out that uh, when they were going to send information about um, council having to go and uh, and and basically take children out of their homes in order to place them in a different uh, environment where they are safer, that decision was sent by fax. Uh, and they had pre-programmed pre the fax, so it actually went to the wrong recipient. Now, fortunately, that recipient understood quite, a, quite immediately that this is very sensitive information. I need to contact them in order to avoid them sending me facts about individuals that are, are, have been deemed not capable of, of taking care of their own children. But they didn't change the pre-programmed fax number. So it, it continues to be telefaxes sent to the same uh, other private organization, which was a building company. So having not just honesty and transparency about the risks with new technologies, but also with what you're doing right now, because we have, of course, um, sort of status quo bias, and we think that what we're doing right now, that's the, uh, that's the most safe and the secure way we're doing, but it isn't. And quite often, that's where the failures happens when we're not prepared to have that open, openness and transparency of the problems with our current ways of doing things. 
And I would say that some of these are e-facts. I mean, just the, the facts, but it's it's an old, like a sort of old school fax machine. It's it's an e-fax service that may or may not be secure either. And I'm sure that the we could probably spend the next few hours just uh, talking about these these type of examples. You know, that it's littered with with examples that yes, some of them are just uh, seems almost like trivial. Why would they not? You know, it's such a sensitive information. Why wouldn't it just you know reconfirm the the fax number? Um, and you know, we we communicate by email, which is kind of the main main source of communication. And emails are, can be just by the nature of email protocols is pretty open. There's man in the middle. There's there's a business email compromise. Uh, if somebody really wants to get into the system, uh, they can lurk into your email into the email system and and be be waiting for for a transaction we've seen that a lot with uh with some transfer funds and so on okay. and talk to me about we talked about the kind of the process so the issue is uh in democracies you have the politicians that are they want to get elected and get want to get voted so they they have to a lot of times look at the popular decision so you know, someone would say, okay, you know, we can leverage AI to create an unbelievable type of uh, individual instructions for, for kids, for children, for, you know, completely unbelievable, tailored, and do it in such a... But are you going to be popular with with the the teacher's union, the, the millions of people that are, are working in these jobs and are at the voting age? So... You know where I'm going with this. It sometimes it seems like you, sometimes you, you you know you're better off with somebody who can make the decisions that's not uh, you know based on the popular vote. Am I going to get elected? Because we see that all the time. We also see some of the economic policies, right? Where you know everybody you know wants to have a fifty dollar minimum wage, and it sounds great. It sounds phenomenal. I want to. And I think you know let's let's give everybody. The only problem is then. Then a burger costs you know fifty dollars because the, the cost of you know manufacturing or you know, running the business is is sky high, but it's on the surface it's a great uh, you know it's a great offering. So how do we solve that as a? And I'm not saying it's all bad. Um, democracies have its own uh, you know merit. Obviously, you know I, I'm a great proponent of of that that type of regime, uh, but. Is there anything we can do? And and then on top of that, there's all these lobbyists, right, in Washington and and in the EU, where they affect policymakers a certain way. Uh, enterprise also does it, right? They spend millions, not billions, into affecting the policymakers by con contributing to the campaigns. So it's a long preempt to declare we have a problem. But the sky's not falling, and I would love for you to, to kind of brainstorm because again, you're you're looking to affect and make the change. How can we resolve um, this type of issue where it's fundamental? How how our, our economies and how our our political system is run? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that goes to the heart of that motivational problem that I was tr trying to talk about, which is I mean, there is there is one element to it, which is about information. But as I said, I mean, the information problem is is um, Pretty Secondary. small in comparison. Yeah. yeah, pretty small in comparison to the motivational problem, and I, I don't really have a uh, sort of a any major wisdom or theory to offer there. My only experience is that um, most changes that happen to different systems, whether they are in in politics, public policy, or if they are in private organization. They tend to be the results of others having moved forward and established a precedent for what you can do, uh, how you can learn from those who actually uh, went faster than you or went before you in terms of, of trying to do something else. Um, you have pioneers, entrepreneurs, or others that you know, do the trial and error process and trying to learn from changes, learn from how, for instance, you can work with technology within, say, school system or any other system in order to bring about uh, improvements. And 
And that, that means you should probably invest more in different mechanisms for transferring learnings from one organization from another, from one system to the other, from one country to the other. And I think this is something which we are heavily underinvested in, just trying to understand what others are doing and learn from what others are doing. If you look at, I mean, to go back to the example I used with cloud in public administration, for instance, it's not going to happen by, by decree, by there is going to be a world government or a federal government in DC saying, now every organization is going to do this. I don't think that's going to be the way you can address it because you're never, probably never going to get to the point where they can actually make that decision because resistance, resistance is going to be too strong. But you can certainly allow for different experiments to, uh, to move ahead and for supporting regulatory, perhaps financially or fiscally if that's needed, with different attempts in order to explore these new things. And once they've done uh, and if they can, if they can demonstrate that they have improved on what they were doing previously, that's an extraordinarily good example to have in order to transfer to other organizations. And even if human nature tend to be conservative, I mean, human nature is also, uh, pretty, um, clear, pretty sticky when it comes to not wanting to be worse than my peers and, and. Sometimes it's going to be more of a competitive spirit. Sometimes it's a cooperative spirit. Sometimes it's a, it's a spirit of sharing knowledge, uh, but working with these dynamics in order to foster change. I mean, that's, that's been my experience from processes of change in sort of mature democracies of the type that we're talking about. And sometimes events like large scale events are also causing change. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I just heard the other day that the Second World War is what what created the canned food. You know, the, the, yeah. the forces were looking at uh, by so they they created something to solve an issue during that time, and then now I I, I don't say that canned food is definitely like necessarily a good thing. Um, I'm just saying that it caused some change, and then we've seen just recently you know, the adoption of technology, and then uh, you know with for example the CrowdStrike outage that affected. A tremendous amount of of um, of systems uh, worldwide, and now Microsoft is coming back and say, "Well, you know, we're not going to allow some kernel access." But there's there's some you know large scale of changes as well, like in terms of how we adopt technologies, and maybe yeah, maybe we shouldn't have all Microsoft systems. Uh, I know the EU is big on uh, diversity there as well. So let's um, let's move to the kind of the paper itself. Um, uh, the EU's trillion dollar gap in ICT and cloud computing capacities, uh, the case for a new approach in cloud policy. So that's that was a a groundbreaking, uh, I would say, uh, paper that really analyzed the the case for moving into different different way of of doing cloud infrastructure. So talk to me about uh, the inception of that paper you know, what caused it? And then maybe like some of the, uh, for the people that don't have access to it, maybe just the, the top three elements in the, in the, in the paper. Sure. So, I mean, one of the major conclusions of the paper, and it's, it's much more geared towards European policymakers, uh, uh sort of the, 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 the market for papers for, for that crowd than it is if, for international policymakers. But what we're trying to show is that not just years, but even a decades of, of underperformance in Europe when it comes to on the corporate side of investing in cloud solutions, investing in data management, structured data management, and uh, when it comes to the regulatory development that has been happening sometimes on a national level in different European countries and sometimes at the EU level. Um, the result of that underperformance, you know, it builds up over time. And even if the, the change from one, from one year to another may not be very, very substantial in itself, when you start to aggregate things up over a longer period of time, that's when we the talked big about gaps the tanker. Are going to... Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's when the big gaps are going to be seen. And this is what we've seen now with cloud, that European companies, European public administrations, Europe at large is very much behind frontier economies in the world when it comes to 
investment in cloud solutions and adoption of cloud solutions. Now you can say, well, that may not be a big thing. Well, it is a big thing. It's a big thing for the productivity generations that you can have through cloud, but it's also important for understanding the the other forms of technological developments that happens when you have access to structured management of your data. AI, for instance, I mean, there is no, there's not going to be any magnificent productivity enhancement with AI unless you have an extraordinarily professional data management in, in your own organization. And what we've seen, and this is the other thing we were trying to sort of point to in the paper that underinvestment in cloud also leads to deficiencies in AI and a gap between Europe and frontier economies in the world when it comes to the development of AI and the adoption of AI. It's the same thing we, if we should start to explore, for instance, quantum technology and what we can do with quantum technology, say 10, 12, 15 years from now, it requires uh, a type of data operations of a kind which, which forces Europe to invest a lot more into it. We were trying to calculate what these differences were and we are pointing to basically a trillion dollar gap in terms of, of investments in, in, in cloud between um, Europe and America. Um, I think if we would start to go deeper into some of these figures, for instance, looking at the gap between the EU and the United States when it comes to AI investments, we would definitely see a much a much greater gap than the one we identified. But the point here is basically to try to force greater economic realism in Europe and that we need to find ways to invest more in new technology. And well, you mentioned the AI drivers are huge. Uh, I know that here in the States, they're making tremendous investment into um, AI first data centers, meaning it has AI has very specific requirements in terms of the, um, the, the power consumption, the deployments of these data centers, and it requires a heavy lifting from a capital expenditure perspective. Um, and, and you're right, you're not going to see, it's just AI, it's just a tool, you need to have it deployed somewhere. Um, so why do you think, and, and everybody wants, I mean, the AI, you know, AI promise is, I'm sure the policymakers are, are excited uh, to, to see some of the efficiencies of promises, uh, efficiencies uh, at all levels in the in the private sector as well as the public sector. So why don't they... They realize that okay, in order for to see the gains and and potentially deploy these, you you have to invest in infrastructure now. Again, it's nothing that's happening overnight, and not just the the infrastructure, but potentially the the power sources required. And you know, we're talking about e, e, ESG, environmental social governance. So the EU is big on controlling that. So so there's a lot going into this, um, and it's again, it's what you describe. It's you know, if you have to do something now, now, it will only affect, uh, we'll look like the 2030s by the time things are really uh, ready to be deployed. So why not, uh, why is the gap? Why is such a major gap? And I'm, I'm assuming that it's a really great that you came out with the paper now and not two years from now. I mean, the gap, if you look at the exponential growth of that gap, I'm, I'm sure like if you, two years from now, you've been like 2.1 trillion. I don't know what the, the slope of that graph will look like. Oh, absolutely, and I mean that's exactly the thing. Which is, uh, you need to you need to jump on the train. Uh, I mean, there is no viable economic strategy here which says, well, let's wait ten years and let's let's a few others go ahead and see what can happen with this one, and then we can start to. You, you know, over that period of time, the amount of capital of knowledge of experience that we've gone into it would be so magnificent that it's just extraordinarily difficult to catch up. The, uh, the, go ahead. The, 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 the other thing related to what you were saying is that with many of the technologies, you take, for instance, AI, it's not as if AI is a ready-made product which is there on the shelves and you, you have a defined desire like, you know, I want to eat tacos for dinner tonight. And you say, well, I want to have an AI solution for this. And then I just go into and, and go into the store and buy it. That's that's not what it is. I mean, AI is more than anything else. It's 
it's an evolutionary process within most organizations where you, you deploy capital, you deploy human capital, and then you start to experiment with your products, your services, your organization in order to try to figure out how this is going to develop over time. And you, you're going to get gradually better for every time, for every day you make these investments, you're going to get better at it. Um, now, what I see quite often in Europe is, is sort of more of a conservative attitude to these things um, where they are uh, hesitant about, well, we don't know exactly if AI is going to be that beneficial as many people are saying. We can't really see any change would have happened over the past two years, so it may it may not lead to anything grander in the future. Uh, all these uh, AI evangelists that are out there uh, preaching how organizations and governments are going to change, we haven't really seen anything of that coming true yet. So why don't we why don't we have a more of a a wait and see attitude, or or perhaps even talk it down? Um, in Europe, there has been attempt to try to draw attention to the fact that, for instance, uh, Facebook haven't been offering its AI, some of its AI solutions to European users of Facebook. When Apple released its new iPhone now, uh, Apple 16, iPhone 16, the AI functionality uh, that you can use in America, it's not available in the European market. and. And the European Com Commissioner for Competition was basically saying she was relieved that she wouldn't have to have an AI functionality in her iPhone. And, and I think that is a, it's a telling attitude to these things. Um, and it may, it may be that the AI functionality that comes in Apple 16 is not going to be that magnificent, but it's an evolutionary process where I train as a user, where Apple train as a company, and we try to figure out uh, how these things are going to evolve in the future. But in order to be part of that process, you need to be on it. You need to jump on that train and be on it. And if you say, well, I'm actually relieved that I can uh, protect myself from the invasion of AI in my, in, my, in my mobile phone, well, then you're probably never going to be uh, in that point, we're actually participating in that evolutionary process to the degree necessary in order to to see the long term com compound benefits that are going to emerge. And as we discussed, we don't live in a bubble, meaning that in order for the EU to stay competitive, you have to leverage some of those uh, processes. And and maybe there's no um, immediate impact or and I would, I would beg to differ. I would say that uh, if you look at the adoption of uh, AI in, for example, financials, it's staggering. It's really staggering. It's, uh, and it, of course, they're early adopters, uh, but they're looking at ways to, to save money and make more money with AI. Basically, that's a driver. And there are also potential drivers looking at uh, technological innovation, right? So if you... If you can allow the the adoption of a faster iteration, for example, in in biotech, using the AI models and and so on, there's so so many applications. And you're right; it's it's you cannot put your your head in the sand and pretend like we're uh, it's not going to happen. It's it's going to happen regardless if the EU is uh, and 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 I think also people would would demand for it. I mean, I'm I'm assuming there's 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 going to be a lot of people that are going to try to enable it regardless of the, the you know, or trying to jailbreak or trying to apply something else on top of it. Um, recently, I, and this is very timely, um, uh, the French member of European Commission resigns. Um, and, uh, you know, the, he was criticizing uh, the executive branch. Um, I believe they're just, uh, it, it, you know, talk about the, Specifically around the uh, the EU um, digital policy, uh, I believe it was uh, Breton's. Um, so, and this has just happened just the other day. Uh, do you have the backdrop of that, and is that related to some some of the things that you're trying to do in terms of moving innovation quicker? Because I know that they were against, like, just at a very high level, they were against some of the 
you know, some of the innovation that is was pushing, being pushed from, from the US. So I, I, I mean, there are probably many, many reasons for why, uh, not just why I decided to resign. I think that was just a, um, uh, an acknowledgement of the fact that many of the member states in, in the EU, so national governments in Germany or Netherlands, Ireland, etc., cetera, uh, they weren't happy with him. They think that he has, um, he has chosen an approach to how we can generate faster technological driven economic growth in Europe where it just hasn't happened and where he'd become more of a roadblock to the type of changes that needs to occur. And I think as a result of that, he weren't offered a very senior position by um, the commission president who set up on the line when she was now trying to form her new team. Um, so he decided I'll, I'll, I'll go out with a bang rather than on a whimper. And, and he went out with a bang. Um, and do you think that uh, that would trickle down to send a message that he used as making a turn in terms of deciding where to go in terms of, of its, its policies towards towards innovation? Well, let's let's see. Um, I think there is you much greater optimistic. Version. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm more optimistic now than I was a few years ago about Europe in the sense that at least there is uh, the beginning of a realization that Europe needs to do and needs to change a lot of things in order to improve and to be more capable of shaping ec economic outcomes in the future. And for a long time now, I think we, I mean, the, the expression I've used is that we've taken a holiday from economic reality and thought that we were you know, we could go ahead and basically do whatever we wanted to do and there, were, were, there weren't going to be any consequences as a result of it. We could regulate data privacy much faster, much deeper, much harder than any other country and it was not going to have any consequences on, say, app development or how companies invest in different uh, consumer-facing uh, products and services which gets GDPR covered. Of course, there was always going to be these type of consequences, and we have seen them emerging. And and it's a different question if you know if policymakers see all these consequences and then they decide to change and they decide to try to improve on policies. That I don't know, but I think that at least there is an opening now of having a conversation around these issues, which feels more constructive than it was just a few year, few years ago. I think what's also helped here is um, uh, we had the former. Uh, governor of the European Central Bank, who just last week uh, released uh, a report on the future of European competitiveness, a report he had been tasked by the European Commission to write, and he was gloomy. My God, he was gloomy. He was sort of talking in a way as we have an existential threat in Europe that, you know, the type of welfare, the type of society, the type of green policies, the type of peace that we've grown used to over a long period of time, that's not going to endure unless we can also generate the resources in order to pay for it. And, and hopefully that type of wake up calls can help us to move policies as well. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? The, the impact that technology has on the fabric of society, because we're, we're, you know, technology is now embedded in it and then it trickles the effects of technology and adoption of technology trickles down to every aspect of our lives. Um, and there's no escape from that. You advocate to a uh, cloud free trade approach. And some would say, well, now because of the, the cloud providers from the US that are so advanced, you're, you know, you're potentially just letting, you know, these companies come in and swoop the European Union with their, with their products and services. What's your take on, on that, that approach? Well, it's, it's already happened. Um... I mean, if you if you want to, if you want to have, say, the the most advanced cloud system for business processing optimization, if you want to have a cloud system with the best cybersecurity features, uh, you have to go with one of the big American suppliers. Uh, comparing sort of the top five uh, suppliers of cloud service in the world with the top performance in Europe, it's it's like comparing uh, the newest 
Porsche well, with the Ford automobile from the 1960s. That's how big the difference is in terms of quality, in terms of features uh, in that particular service, what you actually can do with it. Uh, the cloud sort of free trade approach is, is, it's more about that Europe now shouldn't start to introduce barriers which says, well, you know, if you're an American supply or if you're headquartered in America, if you're um, if sort of the, the, the passport you carry as a company, if it doesn't say European Union on it, well, then we're going to introduce a barrier, which means that you are not able to compete for contracts, say, in public services. Um, um, so when public administration going to build up different type of cloud solutions, you're not, you're not allowed co to compete. Even if you can say that, well, all the data that we're going to have here, they are going to be stored in Europe. Uh, we're going to draw on human capital and some technologies that we have in, in other parts of the world, not just America, but in, in other parts where we have our technology centers. But we're going to create a solution which is, is safe. It's going to lead to the efficiencies that you demand, uh, but that's not enough. Um, so we've seen contracts for contracts in many different European countries have been denied to basically American big tech because they're American big tech and they've instead given them to local suppliers and quite often they haven't been managed to build that system that they were tasked to do in that contract. You know, the issue is, is the amount of investment required to... To, so let's say you and I are sitting down and uh, having a coffee somewhere and say, well, why don't we create a data center? Why don't we innovate and we get some, what are we talking about from a capital expenditure? This is not something that, and it's really um, in the economy because to create an app application and leverage the cloud has very low barriers to entry. Almost anybody can, can spin off you know, go to the code something and then spin off a service and you can see the innovation that way, even leverage LLMs in that process. But to actual creating the data center, we're talking about massive endeavor uh, from a capital expenditure. Also, I'm assuming just in the EU, just getting the permits and, and getting the space and getting all the, the required uh, power consumption connection, all of that. Is massive. So how do we, how do we resolve, how do we ch make that change again? Because it's there's only a few players. It's almost like a, I would I would compare it to you know you you mentioned cars. How many car manufacturers are there? It's almost like you and I decided to like let's create a new, you know, new car. And and maybe that's possible. And I've seen some some smaller players, but it's it's still massive expenditure. That's right. And. Um... I don't think that there is, you know, when you have um, an established market like that, where sort of the R&D spend, only looking at the R&D spend, and you compare, say, uh, AWS, Microsoft, and a few others with uh, the top European uh, cloud suppliers, you're going to see there are oceans in difference in just R&D spend in trying to develop this technology and improve on it. Uh, on the CapEx side, so the amount of resources that need to go into building the technology infrastructure, the data infrastructure, then you have all the other things, the market organization, the business organization, how you can actually have talented people that can go around with your clients and actually create something in their organization, which is not just about the, you know, the tech itself, it's about what you do with the technology in terms of, of changing an organization. There is, there is no other company in, in, in Europe which are even remotely close to what these big companies are doing. So the, the whole notion sort of that, you know, it's desirable for Europe to try to sort of start to invest now in order to be, have sort of a European champion cloud, say, in 20 years' time. I find, I find that to be remarkably, a remarkably poor way of using your resources. But there's a different way to look at it, which is... Well, I'm pretty sure that the cloud market 10 years from now is not going to look like what the cloud markets are doing right now. When you look at the big trends that are happening in with, uh, say, a decentralized internet, when you look at uh, 6G, XG, and the developments where you basically break down the barriers between hardware and software, between devices and data, between uh, uh, sort of 
other type of boundaries that we've grown used to, how we think that, when, that we use when we think about how these services attract to, th these boundaries are probably not going to be there in the future. And, and perhaps that's where Europe should try to figure out. Perhaps it should invest more and provide more incentives for companies to invest in all these network equipment producers that we have, the old Ericsson's and the old Nokia. What are they going to do in order to change the cloud markets 10 years from now? I think there's an opportunity there. I think it would be much more fruitful as a sort of an overall economic strategy for Europe to think in those terms rather than to say, so how do we, how do we have someone who competes on ex the existing structural cloud services today, but we compete in 10 years from now with European champion? And there are forces in play that I think can really affect that in a positive way. The, uh, oh, absolutely. The U.S. just, uh, they're about to um, create a, a, a legislation specifically to prevent from the use of routers and switches that are made in, in, in China, for example. Um, yep. So Ericsson, Nokia, they, you know, it's prime for them to, to catch up and maybe potentially provide a displacement or uh, an alternative to to Chinese um, routers and switches. And then the, you see like massive partnerships. Intel just partnered with uh, Amazon AWS uh, to look at um, the cloud infrastructure, specifically around the Intel processes. They're now creating, NVIDIA is obviously the, leading the way with creation of, of chips that are specifically designed to run uh, AI uh, engines, and it's it's bigger. Like we, we, you know, who's the equivalent of Nvidia and EU? Uh, who, you know, AMD is Intel. You know, the chip manufacturers as well. There's almost like a race. We we seem like we're in a cold war um, around chip manufacturing and around who was going to be able to leverage the AI. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, for for you know, potentially also for uh, national security type of of resources. Um, so I always like to to leave with a positive note, um, meaning that you, you know, your little tugboat trying to move the tanker, you're making an impact. There are people listening, right? There's, uh, there are um, maybe... Maybe you should start small, as you mentioned, potentially some, some pockets within the EU that are maybe more innovative. There's certain governments that are looking at uh, potentially creating uh, jobs or creating innovation in their particular geographical area. Um, just uh, what's your take on it? If, you, if we do this again in 12 months from now, uh, what do you see the impact of of some of these efforts from from your your organization as well as overall in the marketplace? Well, I mean, also, I mean, talking about the positive and ending sort of on a positive note, I, I mean, the good news is that um, the new type of economy which is emerging, which is heavily driven by not just technology but by ideas more broadly. I mean, technology is basically. Uh, the embodied form of a new idea, new knowledge, a new innovation, a new way of looking at different things. Yeah, the good and news capabilities, with, right? Same as... Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, the good news with it is that there is no, no tariff in the world which is going to stop all that knowledge or these ideas flowing across borders. You know, there may be, say, a GDPR type of regulation, there may be an AI act which is going to slow things down, but the notion that you actually are going to be able to put up barriers to a kind that all these new ideas aren't going to flow across borders, I find that almost impossible. And I think this is also what we can find that, I mean, it's bad news for Europe in the sense that we have a lot of talent, a lot of human capital that, but they work with organization in other parts of the world when they have something fascinating, they bring it first to a different part of the world, but at least they have an opportunity to engage with it. And, and I, I find that to be an optimistic way of looking at the future, which is that we're not really about to enter into new, say, national security paradigm where we can go back to, say, 1940s or 1950s of having 
extraordinarily compartmentalized, uh, a compartmentalized world economy where you did this in America, we did this in, in European countries, you did that in the Soviet countries, etc. I, I don't really see that happening. Actually, I, what I see is that organizations are investing even more to have that cross-border uh, structure, how they, how they think, how they develop, how they structure uh, the, 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 t the type of product they're trying to do. So even if, even if you can't market in, Euro in Europe, you have Europeans sitting in Europe actually developing it, and, and then it's going to end up being to the benefits of, Europe, sort of American consumers rather than European consumers. But, but I find that to be sort of a good starting point also to think about European possibilities. Absolutely, and there's, there's an opportunity as well. You look at all these... So because of the gap, so somebody can step up there, maybe in maybe vendors and maybe hundreds of not thousands of vendors can step in and see an opportunity in that gap. How do we can leverage uh, our expertise into working with the European Union to to minimize that gap over time? Um, there's going to be thousands of vendors that potentially can offer maybe the the software, the the know how. Um, you know, to to get things up to speed, um, you know, from Absolutely. both sides, right? So, uh, definitely an opportunity there. Uh, Frederick, thank you very much for joining me today. If people want to reach out thank to you, you so to, much. to know more uh, about your organization, maybe just consulting, because you you seem to be on the forefront of what's happening, and in the kind of the cross section of all the different domains. Uh, what's the easiest way for people to reach you? Well, drop me an email. My, my email is actually available on, on our website, which is ecipe.org. Uh, feel free to contact me or contact any of my colleagues. And we are we're welcoming all sort of uh, good people out there that are willing to engage with us. So feel free to do so. So what, do you have an idea for the next paper? Oh, oh I mean, we have uh, <laughs> lots of things going on uh, simultaneously and, and lots of new things in technology. And I'm also writing a book on technology, which I hope to come out uh, oh, phenomenal. a long time from now. So we should do a session before you release the book, maybe uh, talk about that. I'll, I'll love to, to get a copy as well. Uh, Frederick, sure. it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, for those who joined us, thank you very much for joining me today. Much appreciated. Looking forward to, to seeing you the next episode. And until then, uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you very much.